I first published the, uh, the outline of classes for the Instituto, um, I had a couple of people tell me that I went home and spent two hours looking up some of the words in the dictionary to figure out what, what Pentateuch and hermeneutics and homiletics and, you know, all those kinds of things are. Well, that's part of the process as we learn these things. Um, a couple of things I want to do as preliminary here today. Um, Policies and requirements. If you are wanting, this is particularly important to you if you're taking the class for a certificate or a degree. For those of you who have taken pretty much all of the previous classes in the first two terms, this is our third term of the Lakeside Institute of Theology, then after this term, some of you will be eligible for our first level of certificate, which is a certificate of biblical studies, which requires eight classes, and we will, we've taught six already. These are the uh, three more, so we'll have nine. Some people will be eligible for that first certificate. We do offer a certificate of biblical studies, a certificate of biblical studies and maturity, uh, a master's of uh, biblical studies, and a master of biblical studies and ministry. Uh, the full 24 courses that we'll be offering is required for the master's degree. Again, I always have to say we are not accredited in the United States, we are not, you know, unlike a college or a seminary, there's nobody for us to apply to for accreditation except the Mexican government, and they've said we can offer degrees. Uh, but I believe that people who take the courses, you'll have a very credible curriculum vitae and a letter from the, uh, the president provost of Lakeside Institute of Theology <laughs> saying that you've completed all the requirements for this, and hopefully that, that would be uh, good, but again, I don't want people to think they can finish the courses here and go up there and get a teaching job because if they start checking out the accreditation, that's not going to work. Um, what can you do with it in Mexico? Well, in Mexico, you can do virtually anything. <laughs> uh, for, pe for people in Mexico who wish to be ordained, for instance, which is what the um, is a primary reason for the the masters of biblical studies and ministry, then we, as a denomination, Lakeside Presbyterian Church are recognized as our own denomination in Mexico. Not because we wanted to be necessarily, uh, but there isn't a Presbyterian denomination we could really affiliate ourselves with theologically in Mexico. So um, we will eventually have ordination here. Uh, I, I don't know how this would qualify you for teaching positions elsewhere, but again, the, the government of Mexico has given us certification to be able to offer the degrees. You might be qualified to teach here. You might be qualified <laughs> to teach here, which we're going to want people to do. Um, at some point so okay these are the policies and requirements the classes are free but all students seeking a certificate or degree must purchase the books the paper books not electronic books I've made a couple of exceptions uh, for that when I say electronic by that I mean like Kindle because most of these books are available on Kindle but it's very difficult for me to teach if you're using just the Kindle because I can't say turn to page 97 or you know make sure you read through these pages because Kindle doesn't number them that way okay so that's why I ask you to use the paper book it's also true that one of the one and but trust me you know Carolyn and I are the hugest fans of electronic books we've had we've had electronic books since most people that before they heard of electronic books uh, rocket ebook you ever hear a rocket ebook you know, we had those before anybody else did, so, <coughs> before most people did. So we believe in the electronic books, but I want you to get the paper books, because you can look back and forth, you can look up references in the index, things you can't do in an e-book. All right, mm -hmm. students in the certificate or degree tracks may miss no more than one class per course without arrangements made in advance with the teacher to make up that missed work at the discretion of the teacher. Now, what I do on that very simply, if you miss, you're allowed one class of the eight in each course. There are eight classes in each course. You're allowed to miss one, but you, uh, if you miss more than that, you have to go online and review the video. All of these classes are videotaped, and all of the notes that you see are online. And in fact, you can go back and review any of the materials from any of our past courses. All of the lectures are on there. So, litchapala.org. LIT stands for Lakeside Institute of Theology. LITchapala.org. You can find all this stuff. And each week I will try, and I for, simply forgot this week, to get this stuff posted before we start the class. Okay? Um, students in certificate or degree tracks will be required to take a pass-fail final exam in each course based on study guidelines provided by the teacher. About three quarters of the way through this class, I will give you a document which tells you everything you need to know to take the test. Those most of you have been in here before. Is that true? Yes. 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 Okay. 
And I believe studying that and taking the test is an important part of learning this stuff. I try very hard to make the test itself an educational experience in terms of helping you think through the answers of that stuff. So I encourage you to do that even if you're not taking this first certificate degree. I think it helps you learn it. And nobody knows the score except you and me, okay? As long as you're nice to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> kidding. S students in certificate or degree tracks must take a pass make a passing grade that's based on pass-fail in each course in order to receive credit toward a certificate or degree. If you attend all the classes, and you stay awake during the classes, and you take the test and make pass-fail, uh, and a passing grade on the test is, is 65 or more, so it's a fairly lenient grading system, um, then, then you will pass that class. And then candidates for degrees of Master of Theology and Master of Theology in Ministry um, must be approved by the Institute Director before final admission into the degree program. Meaning, if you want to take those degrees, I want to talk to you about you know, what you want to do with it and what your goals are so that I make sure you're getting what you need. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay, Pentateuch. This is the outline, and all of this kind of material is available online. Um, we'll talk about what the Pentateuch is, an introduction to it today. Next week, we will look at uh, the first part of the book of Genesis. Now, the Pentateuch, of course, you probably know, or we'll talk about today, are the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Genesis has two uh, distinct parts. Chapters 1 through 11 is the prehistoric prologue. It's the story of four great events, the creation of the universe, the fall of humanity, um, the uh, flood, and the Tower of Babel. So next week we will look at those four major events, which are called the prehistoric prologue. They're prehistoric because they're before things were written down. History started when writing started happening. So uh, that's why they're called the prehistoric prologue. Genesis 12 to 50 is the story of the patriarchs, starting with, um, with Abraham, his son Isaac, Isaac's son Jacob, and then one of Jacob's son Joseph. Joseph was not himself a patriarch, but his story takes up the largest portion of the book of Genesis, and it's critical to understanding the history of the Hebrew people. Um, it actually starts midway through chapter 11, by the way. We generally just break it because Abraham's introduced in chapter 11, but starts in chapter 12 in terms of his story. Then, week four, we will look at the first 18 verses of the book of Exodus. This is the story of God's uh, deliverance from slavery in Egypt of the Hebrew people. You know, leading up to the crossing of the Red Sea and going out into the desert and up to Mount Sinai. The first great event of the book of Exodus is is the exodus, which means the exit, the leaving, when the Hebrew people came out of Egypt. Then week five, we will look at the rest of um, Exodus, which is 19 through 40, the giving of the law, or the covenant at Mount Sinai, when Moses, the great lawgiver, the servant of God, was given the, the Mosaic law, as it's called now. We're going to talk about the law of Moses quite a bit today. Um, and then what they did with it and how it was outlined. This is the Ten Commandments and a lot of the stuff that follows that. Week six, we are going to look at the book of Leviticus. Leviticus is the rule of the Levite. Levites were the priests. The book of Leviticus is the priestly law. In one way, you can understand that Exodus is what God did for his people, and Leviticus is what God expects his people to do in response to him. All right? And we're going to talk as we go along about how these things fit together. Um, so Leviticus in week 6. Week 7 is the book of Numbers. Basically, Numbers is the story of the, the Israelites wandering around the desert for 40 years. It covers the period of time when they were prevented from entering the Holy Land because of their unbelief. And so it's, it's the events associated with that. It's called Numbers because there's two places in Numbers where they take a census of all the people and they give you all the details about how many people were in each tribe. That's why it's called Numbers. And then finally, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is really three great discourses from Moses to the Israelites. And part of it is a, re, uh, a retelling of the law. Deuteronomy literally means the second law, because the Ten Commandments are restated for the Israelites 40 years later after they were given the first time and before they go into the Promised Land. So the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, end with the people just preparing to cross over into the Promised Land Moses, at Moses' death and Joshua 
being anointed as the, uh, the new leader of the Israelites. And that's why at the end of Deuteronomy, we go to Joshua, the story of Joshua, and it picks up with the Israelites crossing over into the Promised Land. Okay? So these five books, we're going to talk about them a little bit today, um, give you kind of an introduction to the major themes and some of the questions associated with them. Today I'm going to give you kind of the, the academic background of some stuff. Next week we're going to actually dig into the text and talk about what, what the stories are and what the messages are and what the meanings of those things are. Before I do that, I need to give you a couple of slides here that I use before every Bible class that I teach, at least in, a, in this kind of setting. Uh, the first is, on what do we base our faith? Most of you have seen this before, but we always need to be reminded of this. We base our Christian faith on four major principles of God's revelation. We believe that our faith is a revealed faith. Somebody didn't just go out and find it. God chose to reveal His will, Himself and His will and, his, and our Christian faith to us. The, there are four ways in which God has revealed Himself to us. First is the revelation of God in Scripture. And these four, by the way, are in descending order of authority. The authority of God's Word, the written Word of God in Scripture, trumps everything else. If anything disagrees with this, this wins in terms of our Christian faith. And in saying that, that is the Orthodox Christian view. And by that I don't mean Eastern Orthodox or Greek Orthodox. Orthodoxy is uh, from two Greek words and it means right belief. The right belief, meaning the standard set of beliefs that Christianity has maintained as central for the last 2,000 years. And yes, there have been heresies that have gone off from that, and people have disagreed with it, but the basic Orthodox Christian faith, what C.S. Lewis called the mere Christianity, the basic principles, always include that the primary authority for our faith is the truth of God's revelation in Scripture, and that trumps everything else. So that you know that's not just my idea, or at least the Presbyterian Church's idea, that's been the belief of the Christian Church for 2,000 years. The second way in which God has revealed himself is directly to the church down through history. Now, that's subordinate to the authority of Scripture. But God does speak through his church. That is often reflected, for instance, on the, in the creeds. The great creeds of the church are sort of shorthand statements of what it is we believe based upon the truth of Scripture, but as articulated by the church down through history. The third uh, level of revelation that God has given us is the revelation of God in the world. When we say in the world, Scripture says that the beauty of God's creation testifies to the truth of God. It says that in several places, especially the Psalms. It's also true that our own rationality, our mind, if we use it correctly, I believe, lead us to God. God gave us to be rational creatures for a reason. And so that's often called general revelation, the revelation God gives us in the general environment, whereas the uh, revelation of God in Scripture, for instance, is called special revelation, or sometimes specific revelation. But the general revelation of God in the world, by the nature of his creation, by our, the, the nature of the human mind to perceive him, that's general revelation. And the fourth is the revelation of God to individual people. We believe that God, through the Holy Spirit, speaks to individuals. As Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, we have the Holy Spirit in us. And He speaks to us. He teaches us. He comforts us. He convicts us of our sin. God does speak to people today. Now, God does not speak to people, even though people may think they're hearing God. God does not speak to people in any way that is contrary to number one, the revelation of God in Scripture. When you get someone who comes along and says, well, God has told me that we need to, you know, that it's for our salvation, it's necessary for us to marry at least four wives. No, that's not in Scripture. Okay, um, th that's the principle of the you know the fundamentalist Mormon belief. Uh, or if it says, well, Jesus wasn't really divine; he was just a really good guy, really smart, and if we listen to him, we'd all be better off. No. I don't care if you think that's something God told you. That's not consistent with the Word of God. So cults. Uh, false religions are examples where people may claim God has spoken to them, but he has not. And the way you can tell is, is it consistent with what we find in this? All right? Any questions about that? That's, before we study scripture, I always want us to make sure that we believe this is authoritative and from God. So what do we believe about scripture? There are four things. 
We believe the uh, Bible is God's word, which is, as I just said, revealed. Jeremiah 30 says, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, write in a book all the words I have spoken to you. We're going to talk about Moses in a little while, and the fact that God inspired Moses to write the Pentateuch, even though a lot of people argue against that. Secondly, we believe the Bible, the Word of God, is inspired. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Then we believe Scripture is authoritative. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. It is authoritative. That is where we find the authority for what we believe. And fourth, we believe that the word of God is living, which means it is not a static book that gets out of style or uh, that you know runs out of truth. It is a living thing. I always say, how many of you have ever read a passage of scripture you have read 10 or 15 or 100 times before, and then suddenly it means something new to you. It applies to something that's happening in your life right now. I think that's one of the ways in which we, we experience Scripture as living. Hebrews 4 says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now, I've been over both of these slides before. But I will always come back to these as a, at the start of our any classes we have on Bible because we need to be clear what it is we believe about the Word of God. Okay, any questions about that? All right, let's talk briefly about first generally the Old Testament just to give you a context and then we're going to talk about specifically the Pentateuch today. Um, the, there's two ways of looking at the Old Testament, that is the, the the Hebrew Bible, we might call it. It was the Bible of the Jewish people, which has come down to us as part of our Bible that we typically call the Old Testament. The word testament is synonymous with the word covenant. So there's the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The traditional Protestant structure is we see the Old Testament as 39 books in four sections. There is the Law, which is five books. Um, it's also called the Torah in Hebrew. Uh, Pentateuch means five books. I'm going to talk about that. The second section, uh, according to the Protestant way of breaking it up, uh, is the history books. There are 12 of those. That's Joshua through Esther. And you will notice that this order I'm giving you, this is the way you will find it printed in your Bibles. All right? uh, then the books of wisdom. There are five of those. From Job through the Song of Songs, also called the Song of Solomon. And then the books of prophecy. There are 17 books of prophecy. Isaiah through Malachi. Malachi being the last book in our Hebrew Bible. Um, sometimes those are broken, uh, broken up into the major prophets, which is Isaiah through Daniel, and the minor prophets, which is Hosea through Malachi. When we say major and minor, it doesn't mean that some are more important than others. The major prophets are simply bigger. They're longer. The, the books of the major prophets are much longer, like 60 chapters, compared to some of the minor prophets, which are one or a few. Okay, That's how we Protestants break it up. Now, I say Protestant because the Catholic Church then has the Apocrypha, um, which are additional books, which are intertestamental books, which they add. If you have a Jerusalem Bible or a Catholic Bible of some other kind, um, there, there are various, the Louis Reigns and others, you will find these, the Apocryphal books in between our Old and New Testament. Um, I'm not going to get into that in this class because we dealt with that already in the survey classes. And by the way, some of the detail on this stuff, if you want to go back and get more detail on some of these other things, we've had classes in Old Testament survey and Old Testament theology. You can go back and see it all on video or review all of the notes from those. So if you hear something and you want more detail on it, if you ask me, I may say, well, go back and check out the videos rather than go into detail for people who have already had those classes. Um, because we want to focus this class on the Pentateuch once we get through the preliminaries. Now, I said the other was the Protestant perspective. The Catholic is the same except it adds the Apocrypha. The Jewish structure for the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible is different. They see not 39 books but 24. It's the same material. They just break it up differently. For instance, we have 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Those are, each of those is one book. Kings is one book. Chronicles is one book. Samuel is one book. They take the 12 minor prophets, 
And it's one book called the Book of the Twelve in the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew Bible. It's the same material, they just break it up differently. And they have three main sections. The first one is the same between the Jewish uh, Bible and the Protestant Bible, and that is the law, or Torah in Hebrew. Uh, the Pentateuch, the first five books, that, that doesn't change. And that gives you some, uh, some sense of the importance of these five books, is that they're seen as being universally consistent as one unit of the Old Testament. The second section in the Jewish Bible is the book of the prophets, uh, which is called Nevaim. Torah is the law. Nevaim is the prophets. There are eight of those, according to the Hebrew Bible. And then the book of the writings, or Ketuvim, in Hebrew. Now, the Jewish people call the whole of their Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, they call it the Tanakh. Tanakh is an acronym. It's taking the three sections of the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, the Nevaim, and the Ketuvim, using the first letters and pushing them together with some, some vowels to hold them together, and it's called the Tanakh. That is the Hebrew Bible. It's also called the Mikra, sometimes informally, which means that which is read. That's, this is just background, so you get an idea. We're dealing with that first section, whether you're looking at the Protestant uh, layout of the Bible, or the Jewish layout. First five books are always the books of the Torah, the law. Now, why study the Old Testament? Why, uh, why do we bother studying the Old Testament? It, it, you know, the name Jesus doesn't appear in there. Some of you have heard me say before, I was a guest preacher at a church who had had a minister for, for 11 years. And when I finished preaching, I preached from the Old Testament. When I finished preaching, Several people came up to me and said, we've been attending here, and in the 11 years prior to you being here, we have never heard a sermon from the Old Testament. Mm. Ever. That is reflective of the fact that many Christians are really fundamentally wrong in their perception of the Old Testament. They think the Old Testament is just sort of, you know, the, the, the prequel, and it doesn't matter anymore, that that's all set aside, and that all that matters now is the New Testament. Well, there are several reasons why I think we, we need to study the Old Testament. It is true the New Testament, or the New Covenant, fulfills and completes, and in that regard is more important to us than the Old Covenant, or Old Testament, but it doesn't throw it away. We really make a mistake when we think that the Old Testament is no longer valid for us and that we don't need to study it. Uh, first reason is because the Old Testament is what Jesus and the apostles are referring to whenever they talk about Scripture. That passage I read you just a minute ago when it said, you know, Paul is talking about his testimony to Jesus according to the Scripture. He's actually talking about the Old Testament. Because Jesus is found in the Old Testament in all of the prophetic promises about the coming Messiah. In fact, if you look in the book of Acts, you look at the great sermons of Peter, if you look at the sermons of Paul, if you read Paul's defenses at the you know, Mars Hill and other places, the way that they explained Jesus as being the Messiah and the Son of God is by going back to the Old Testament. Read the, the beautiful, moving sermon of Stephen right before he's martyred, the first Christian martyr. They use the Old Testament to explain who Jesus is. So it's critically important for us to understand that with one exception in the New Testament, every time they say Scripture, they're referring to the Old Testament. That one exception is in 2 Peter. Peter says that our brother Paul has been writing letters, and he gives them, Peter gives Paul's letters credit as being equal to the rest of Scripture. That's the first uh, reference we have in New Testament writings. Everything else is referring to the Old Testament. Okay? The second reason is because the Old Testament is part of God's inspired revelation to us. This is a message from God. Who are we to throw it away? So much of what we understand, and that's why we're studying the Pentateuch, so much of what we need to understand about um, the creation and about us and about how things started and in, in what's still foundational to everything is based upon the message we have in the Old Testament. Um, and that's sort of what I just said. The Old Testament's foundational to our understanding. It's God's revelation, but it gives us understandings which we cannot perceive correctly the human condition or what we're supposed to do about it unless we have a basic understanding of the principles of the Old Testament. It's also true that the Old Testament is very practical. 
You know, there's real value in there. Read the book of Proverbs. You want to know how to live your life in a more meaningful way? The book of Proverbs is wisdom for life. You want to know how to worship the Lord in a meaningful way? The book of Psalms will get you there. You want to deal with suffering in your life and, and not understand how, how suffering happens and where is God in all of this? Read the book of Job. You want to know what's wrong with people? Why are we like this? You know, read the first 11 chapters of Genesis. It'll tell you everything you need to know about where we came from and what's wrong with us. We'll get to that in a second. And then finally, the Old Testament points us to Jesus Christ. That's why all of the sermons that you find in the New Testament that are evangelistic sermons about the nature of Jesus and uh, what he means and why he's important all use the Old Testament to point to Jesus. So who are we not to think that this is important for us to study? I have, I have get a little heartburn every time I see a, a New Testament and Psalms, you know, and, and they do that so it's easy to carry around. But we're leaving out two-thirds of God's revelation to us when we do that. And I believe the New Testament, the New Covenant, if you had to choose, but you don't, then yes, it is more critical to us. But it makes so much more sense when we put it on the foundation of the Old Testament. Okay? Questions about that? Comments? Yes, Sierra. Where, where was that reference in 2 Peter where it was the only exception? To the I'll have to find it for you. I, I, I'm standing up here and it just went out of my head. I'll think of it in a minute, okay? Um, okay. Let's start talking about the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch are the first five books of the Old Testament. They cover a period of about 2,300 years. And interestingly enough, um, it's not evenly divided. It's not like Genesis 1 to the end of Deuteronomy that's sort of spaced out. In fact, the first 11 chapters of, of Genesis cover the vast majority of that time. Numbers covers about 40 years. Exodus covers just you know a, a relatively short period of time. Um, but overall, it's about 2,300 years. The Hebrew or Jewish name for the first five books of the Old Testament, of the Hebrew Bible, is Torah. Remember, Torah, Nevaim, Kedubim, the three sections of the Jewish Bible is, gives us the name Tanakh. But the Torah means law. But it's not law the way we think about law. It's almost always interpreted law. And when you read the Bible, they'll talk about the law of Moses or you know, the books of the law. Um, a much better word for our understanding when we say law is instruction. That's probably a much better translation of the word Torah, although law is the, more, is the most traditional one. Um, it, it is the instruction for who God is, what the human condition is, and how we are supposed to be in a relationship with God. So that those that the Torah, to use the Hebrew word, we call the Pentateuch. I mean, we still call it the Torah sometimes. But Pentateuch means literally penta, five, like a pentagram, or a pentagon, five-sided. Penta, tuch, uh, uh, it, it literally means five scrolls or five books in Greek. It sometimes is translated the five-part book because the idea of dividing the, um, the, the Pentateuch into separate books Probably, if we, get, if we get it in our head that it's like it's five completely different things, that's inaccurate. Believing that there is one author, the intention and expectation throughout Jewish history was that this really is one work. That's why it's set down as one of the sections of the Jewish Bible, and it's often referred to not, not just as the five, uh, five books, but as the five-part book. They sometimes call it the five-fifths of Moses, because it is one work that is presented in five parts. So why did they break up it in five parts? Well, why did we break first Kings up into first and second Kings? Because originally, almost all of these Bibles were put on scrolls. You guys know what a scroll is. You've seen scrolls, right? It's a roll, and you, bless you, you roll it up on one end as you unroll it on the other, and you go through. Well, the original scrolls that they used were, most of them were made out of papyrus, Sometimes later they use parchment, which is animal skin, but papyrus is a material like paper made out of reeds, and you couldn't have a scroll very long, or it came, became completely unwieldy, and you're likely to tear it as you're trying to roll it and unroll it. So they ended up breaking books up into smaller pieces. 
The five-fifths of Moses, the Pentateuch, almost certainly was originally broken up into Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and they're almost all exactly the same length, by the way, interestingly enough, because that way they could put it on five scrolls, and it didn't become completely unwieldy, and they ended, didn't end up tearing the thing apart when they tried to use it. And especially because the Jews had such a high regard for the, the scrolls of the law. In fact, when a when a biblical scroll, if it ever got torn or ever got, you know, uh, dirty or anything else happened to it, they did not dispose of it. They buried it. They literally gave it a burial because they believed this was the living word of God. In fact, it's thought that when you study about the time in Josiah, the Old Testament king Josiah, they found a scroll of the law and brought it to him. They believed probably that they had a, uh, a scriptorium, which was literally a crypt, a burial place for scrolls. That's how highly they thought of these things. And they believed that there may have been a scriptorium that had been closed up. When they were remodeling the temple, they discovered this hidden room, brought this scroll of the law to Josiah, and that led to the renewal of Josiah because they rediscovered the lost law, which they believed was probably the book of Deuteronomy. But it gives you an idea of how important this was to people, and it was considered one piece originally. The five books of Moses were considered of one part. Uh, in fact, there are a couple places in Scripture where they refer to those books as being Moses, you know, because that reflects their, their knowledge of Moses in that time. Now, what are the, you know, what is Pentateuch all about? Scholars over many years have, have described it in different ways. What kind of genre is it, for instance, this Pentateuch, this five-part book? Um, some have simply said they believe the, whole, the main point is a, it's a biography of Moses. And that Genesis is just kind of a laying the, laying the groundwork for, for it to be a biography of Moses. Because Moses is introduced early in Exodus. Um, and Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy all occur during Moses' life. And Moses was the great lawgiver. In the history of the Hebrew people, there were three truly great leaders. The, the, the triumvirate of major Jewish leaders. Abraham, whose story is entirely contained in Genesis, who is the father. Moses, who was the lawgiver, who brought them out of captivity in Egypt, and through him God gave the law. And then King David later that made them a nation. Right? So Moses is, is a major player, and some scholars have said the whole point of this is really a biography of Moses. I think that's too limited. Other people have said, well, it is a history of the nation of Israel, starting with pre-Israel in the prehistoric prologue. But from the moment Abraham is introduced in the uh, end of the 11th chapter of Genesis, the whole rest of it, in fact, the whole rest of the Old Testament, is the story of the Hebrew people. It's the story of the Israelites. And so some people have said, let's look at it that way. I think the way we need to, to see the, uh, the Pentateuch is the way the Hebrews originally saw it, and that is as Torah. It is instruction. God is teaching us who we are, who He is, and how we're supposed to work with Him, or live with Him, or, or worship Him, what our relationship is supposed to be. And he is instructing us in that regard. It's not just a biography of Moses, although it is that. It's not just a history of Israel, although it is that. It is a story of who God is, who we are, and how we and he are supposed to fit together. All right? The Pentateuch, the five books, or as I said, it's sometimes called the five-fifths of Moses, are, first of all, Genesis. In the Hebrew, the name for Genesis, the... the, the Old Testament books, a number of them, were named in Hebrew based upon the first word. Of the, it's a very simple process. You name the book based upon what the first word in the book was. The first word in the book of Genesis in Hebrew is Berashi, which means in the beginning. When it was translated into Greek, they translated the name into, uh, or gave it the name, um, Genesis, which means the history of origins, the beginnings, the origins. Um, the book of Genesis. The second book, of course, Exodus. The Hebrew name is Ve, uh, Veale Shemot, which means these are the names of, literally. Um, the Greek, when they wrote it, named it Exodus, which means the exit or the departure. Uh, when we talk about Exodus, I've got some pictures I took in Greece when we visited Patmos, and there's an exit sign, you know. It says exit in English, and above that bigger letters in Greek letters, it says Exodus, all right? 
Simple as that. The exodus was the exit. That is the leaving of Egypt by the Hebrews. The third book, Leviticus, in Hebrew is uh, uh, Vayikra, and the Lord called. The Greek name for it is Leuticos, which is uh, relating to the Levites. The book of Numbers is Bimendar, which means in the desert. Remember, Numbers is the story of the Hebrews wandering around for 40 years because of their unbelief before. Um, it was until all of the adult males died who had, who had had unbelief, and it was a whole new generation led by Joshua so that they could enter the Holy Land. Um, the Greek name, interestingly enough, is Arithmoi. I think you can recognize that as being related to numbers. It's where we get our word arithmetic. But the Greek word Arithmoi, referring to the census lists, chapters 1 and 26 of numbers, are counting of the people. And then the last one is Deuteronomy, which the Hebrew is Ele Hadabarim. Sometimes it's just called Debarim, uh, which means these are the words. It's from the Greek uh, Deuteronomia. My mouth's dry here. Deuteronomion, or the second repetition of the law. Um, because before the people go into the Holy Land, they repeat the law to them again so that they're reminded of what it is they're supposed to live like. The. Another way to look at that, Genesis takes us from creation through the origins of God's people, Abraham and his descendants, uh, to the time that they are in Egypt. Um, Joseph, and uh, Joseph became the sort of prime minister of Egypt. The Israelites went down there and lived there. They're living in Egypt at the end of the book of Genesis, the end of uh, Genesis 15. You then get Exodus. Exodus relates to God's deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt after they had been put into slavery, and then the establishing of his covenant law. And you'll notice I mentioned to you that next week we're going to deal with the, um, the first part of Genesis. Week three we'll do with the giving of the law. Um, in, uh, or I'm sorry, the patriarchs, the origins of God's people. And Exodus will deal with the leaving of Egypt, and then the next week the covenant law. Leviticus sets forth the laws of worship. Again, Exodus is what God did for us. Leviticus is what he expects us to do for him, how we are to live a holy life. And then Numbers relates the wilderness wandering in the desert. And Deuteronomy gives the law to a new generation with special emphasis to those entering the land. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, why is this important? Why is it important that we study this stuff? Um, the book, and I do hope you all will all get the book. This is a really good book. I'm more impressed with this one even than the New Testament one that's in this series. Um, they identify a number of overarching themes, and I want to give you those themes first, and then I want to talk about, I'm going to give this to you two different ways, the way the book does, because I think it's good, and then I'm going to give you a couple of other uh, sort of more down and dirty kind of understandings of it. The, um, the textbook identifies that there are five major themes in the, in the Pentateuch. Those five themes are first, the sovereignty of God. That God is the creator and the ruler of everything. Excuse now, me. excuse me. Now, are you, is that on the It's on in the book. Slide? Is that on the slide? I haven't put that on the slide. Okay. Okay. But so this, because, is worth, this is worth writing down. Yeah. yeah, or and you'll find it in the book under section overarching themes. So um, if you have the book, it's all right there. Um, and, and by the way, and you just reminded me, John, last term, I had somebody complain to me twice because she said, I'm reading this stuff, but you're not talking about the stuff that's in the book. Meaning I wasn't lecturing directly from the book. And I said, well, no, I'm, I, I do that on purpose because if you read it in the book, you don't need me to stand up here and read it to you again. Um, so I cover the same basic materials, but I present it to you in a different way. And that way, I think you're getting a, a broader, a more three-dimensional picture of it, and you, and it's a better way to learn. So don't be shocked if you're reading the book and um, you don't. I'm not saying exactly the same things that are in the book. I do that on, you know, that's on purpose. Sure, it would be easier for me if I just had one textbook and I could just get up here and, you know, pretty much read it to you. But that wouldn't be the best for you. So, so that's another reason the book is good because you'll get two different approaches to this stuff. So. Overarching themes, the sovereignty of God. You hear a lot of people will say, well, there are other creation stories. And the book talks about those some. I will talk about those some next week when we talk about Genesis 1 to 11. Um, the Enuma Elish, various other Mesopotamian or ancient uh, Genesis stories, Genesis versions, their version of the beginnings. 
But there's a fundamental difference. You know, people who are trying to take a liberal approach and say, oh, well, Genesis is just one of those. Genesis is fundamentally different than any other ancient uh, creation story in several ways. One, all of the other <coughs> ancient creation stories start out with trying to explain where the gods came from. The gods were created from somewhere. The book of Genesis assumes the presence of an all-powerful God and does not feel the need to explain where he came from. The Enuma Elish, uh, the creation of God Marduk, involved, the, you know, and, and it involved other gods fighting. There's conflict between gods, and they were they created out of, you know, out of the primordial mess that the world was before they came along, and all sorts of things. Genesis assumes the presence of sovereign God. Secondly, all the other creation stories will talk about um, gods having conflict and struggle. They're having a hard time of it. Creation is really difficult. And in one case, like in the Enuma Elish, Tiamat, one of the gods, gets killed and torn in two, and half of her becomes the sky, and half of her becomes the horizon of the earth. Well, this idea of conflict and God's fighting and it being difficult and them having to overcome and struggle, that's not the Genesis story. God exists at the start. He creates without struggle, without uh, material necessary for him to work with, the ex nihilo, and he does so by fiat, by simply speaking. And God said, and it was so. Fundamental difference between that and the other ancient creation stories which assume they have to explain where the God came from first, God or gods, and then how hard it was for them to create the world. Genesis is not like that. Genesis assumes the sovereignty of God and presents that to us. God is, and he made, it was not hard for him, and everything is therefore under his sovereignty. Secondly, the Pentateuch establishes a high priority for history itself. Christianity is fairly unique in that we, ours, and I should say Judeo-Christianity, because we're a continuum in that regard, that ours is a historical religion. It is based upon events actually happening in history. You know, the uh, ancient Babylonian belief that you know, Marduk tore Tiamat in two and created the world from her, that whole religion doesn't have a whole lot of focus on historical events. All right? Um, Hinduism, many of the other religions of today, do not have a historical focus. Ours does, and the Pentateuch is the one that establishes that. That there is a historical line that God has been acting down through time. The third is the fallen condition of humanity. It explains to us what's wrong with us. We'll talk about that in a minute. The fourth is the message of redemption. The book uses the word salvation. I think in an Old Testament context, redemption is a better word. God redeemed his people. Actually, God's, the first redemption of God was in the Garden of Eden. God redeemed Adam and Eve from their own sin and protected them, even as he sent them out. So God's redemption, his caring for those who are his creation. And the word salvation is, is still legitimate. I think redemption makes more sense than an Old Testament context. But it is his salvation of his people. People who think the Old Testament is the story of a God who is, who is judgmental and angry and legalistic, and then the New Testament God is a God of grace and mercy and light and acceptance and, and salvation haven't read the Old Testament. Right? That, that heresy goes back to the 3rd century um, and uh, pre-Marcion and Marcion. Marcion was the greatest, greatest threat to Orthodox Christianity in history. And one of the things he said was that the God of the Old Testament was a different God than the God of the New Testament. Because he interpreted the God of the Old Testament as being legalistic and angry and judgmental and wanting to send people to hell and whatever else. And the God of the New Testament was sweetness and light, gentle Jesus, sweet and mild. That's not accurate to a reading. The Old Testament is the story of God telling his people who, who they needed to be and how they needed to live. They violated that trust and betrayed him. God punished them and then welcomed them back. They betrayed him again. God had to punish them, but then he welcomes them back. It's a process over and over and over again of God expressing his great love to the Hebrew people and always taking them back. So, not inconsistent with our perception of the God of the New Testament. So, the, the theme of redemption comes out in the Pentateuch. And then, final, finally, holiness. The idea, as I say, that redemption is what God does for us. <coughs> holiness is the way he wants us to live and act in response to him. 
Great definition in the textbook. It says that holiness is the human appropriation of God's grace. We become holy when we appropriate God's grace into our lives. Okay, so those five things. Uh, I will put a slide of that for those of you maybe who don't have a book and want to look it up uh, online. But those five points are in the book. Let me give you basically the same thing, but in my own words. Uh, the importance of the Pentateuch is it tells us where we, and in fact, the entire <coughs> universe came from. The story of creation. How did we get here? How did this all start? The Pentateuch gives us an explanation for that. And, it, and, and people would say, oh, well, how can you be a sensible, reasonable person and accept that? You know what? Read this and then read the Enuma Elish and tell me which one is more appropriate to our <laughs> Western sensibilities. Or any of the others, the Gilgamesh epic, or any of the others, which are available in translation now, uh, if you don't read Ugaritic or Akkadian. <laughs> But um, it, it actually, I think, and it's not just because this is so fundamental to, to our historic uh, presence, and Pentateuch is, this stuff is basic to Western culture. It really is a platform on which Western culture is built. But it makes a whole lot more sense rationally and reasonably to us than any other version of creation that comes out of the ancient world. So it tells us where everything, including us, came from. Secondly, it tells us what is wrong with us. The explanation for the brokenness that exists in humanity, the grief and the pain and the, the unreasonableness of death, everyone at some time or another says it should not be like this. You know, a young mother is killed in a car accident and leaves two small children behind. Everybody's reaction, whether they are, however they articulate it, is it shouldn't be like this. Well, the fact is it wasn't supposed to be. And the part of us that says, I don't see why it's like this. How can it be like this? C.S. Lewis says, if something in us tells us that there's something wrong with this world, perhaps it's because we were made for a different kind of world. God intended something else. And yet our betrayal, the introduction of sin in the world, is what made, gave us this sense of brokenness and loss and grief and death. And if you were there for our Easter service, I said there has never been a culture, as far as we know, that didn't have some kind of religion that didn't believe in the supernatural powers of some kind. And secondly, there's never been a culture, as far as we can tell, that didn't believe there was something wrong with us. That there's something broken inside us. That's not, something's not right here. The Pentateuch, especially Genesis, tells us what that is. Okay. Um, the third thing, the Pentateuch reveals to us the nature of God. We are introduced to the God of the whole universe in the Pentateuch. A God who is the creator, who is Redeemer, who is a righteous, loving, forgiving God, still, but the right, we always want to give, leave off the righteous part. He is righteous, He is holy, He is just. We are introduced to the nature of God. And especially those first two, Creator and Redeemer. Some of you have heard me talk about the fact that the two great pillars on which our faith is built is that God created us and has a claim on us because of that. And he redeemed us, and likewise has a claim on our lives because he has redeemed us. Creator and redeemer. We are introduced to that God in the Pentateuch. It also gives us our history. When I say our history, our history is based upon the history of God's call and his relationship with his chosen people. We are the children of Abraham. You may not think you are genetically, although apparently I am. I just participated in, the, the National Geographic has a project called the Genome Project, and you, you give them DNA samples, and they trace where you came from. Where did you come from? from? Well, where you came from, I don't mean, you know, yeah. 1947, Bill and Mary got, no. Uh, it goes back to the foundations of human the genetics. And so they identify for men, male and female, and Africa, almost all people today have genetic code that goes back to Africa. But then it, it demonstrated that there's a three and four likelihood that I'm, I come from Ashkenazi Jewish heritage in Central Europe. Um, probably Germany, you know, Central Europe, then Germany, and then probably Britain, uh, based upon my genetic code. Uh, you can go on National Geographic's website. It costs $199 if you want to do this. Pretty cool, though. Uh, so apparently I do actually come from you know, Jewish heritage uh, at some point. Um, I had no idea that was true. But even if you aren't genetically linked to Abraham, um, you are a child of Abraham by adoption. 
If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, Paul makes it very clear, we are grafted onto the vine. We are adopted into the family of the Hebrew people. So Abraham is our father Abraham too. If you go on the cruise that, that's, and I understand there may have not be any cabins left, but if you, the cruise that I'm speaking on, one of the topics is going to be the children of Abraham. Talking about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all see themselves as linked to Abraham as, as father. So we are told our original history, not just creation history, but history from Abraham on. Okay? And we also find in the Pentateuch a setting of the stage for everything that is to come. A preparation, especially for Jesus and the New Covenant or New Testament that we have, um, the, the, the fulfillment. We, that we see how Jesus and the new promise to us, the salvation that we enjoy in Christ, is a fulfillment of everything that came before. Again, that's the core topic of every one of the great sermons of the New Testament. Peter, Philip, uh, Stephen, Paul, all of them do that. They take the original stage setting from the Old Testament and talk about how that is fulfilled in Jesus and the New Testament. All right? Any questions about that? All right, we're going to take a break. I've got about five minutes till. Let's let's go until about five minutes. Come back again. Um, let's keep going here. Some of, some of the background stuff. I want to talk now about authorship and dating of the Pentateuch. Um, there is no part of Scripture that has been challenged as much in terms of its reliability uh, of its the reliability of the traditional understanding of its authorship and dating than the Pentateuch has. Um, there. Are, and I'm going to talk about the documentary hypothesis and some of those challenges here. And some of you who are in the Old Testament survey, well, again, I'm going to be repeating some of this stuff, but not everybody was in that class, and so we need to make sure we cover this. The issue of authorship and dating of the Pentateuch, whether or not uh, Moses actually wrote it, which tradition has, I'm going to talk about the, the testimony to Mosaic authorship in a moment. And Mosaic is the adjective for Moses, right? You know that. If you talk about Mosaic authorship, that means by Moses doesn't mean a lot of pieces put together. Um, the, the issue of the authorship and dating of the Pentateuch is more than just a literary question. It's not just uh, a matter of interest because when we talk about whether or not Moses really wrote the first five books of the Old Testament um, and whether they were written at the time when, when tradition holds that they were written, which is 1450 to 1400 BC, you know, about, so we're talking about 3500 years ago, 3400 years ago. Um, those questions affect so much more than just, um, oh, well, who wrote it? When did they write it? It affects the whole history of religion. It affects uh, fundamental questions of theology. A moment ago, I just said the Pentateuch gives us information about how the whole world was created, what the nature of God is, you know, uh, how we were made and what's wrong with us. Well, those are fundamental metaphysical questions that are at the, that are at the core of every other theological direction. Well, if, if the Pentateuch, which gives us the foundation for that, is fundamentally flawed, is not, is not what it purports to be, or written by who purported to write it, uh, was purported to write it, or was not early on, then everything else begins to unravel. It is a fundamental theological question, because so many of our critical theological questions find their basis in the Pentateuch. When the Pentateuch was written, and who wrote it, fundamentally goes to the heart of the reliability of Scripture. Because the first five books of the Old Testament are so much the foundation of everything else, which is what I've just been saying for the last hour. Now, I want to start by telling you why I, and more conservative scholars, look at this and say we believe that Moses is the author, or, and I should say author is not a good word to use when you're talking about ancient Hebrew writings. Because they didn't have a concept of authorship the way we do. Uh, the Apostle Paul was quite unique in that. There's a reason why very few of the books of the Bible say, you know, this is written by, you know, I'm Ross and I'm writing this book for you. The first five books of the Bible are anonymous, but what that means is they don't themselves say who wrote them. And again, Paul is, is almost unique in that. The, the ancient Hebrew 
per perception is that when I wrote something for the community, it belonged to the community, it wasn't mine, and I wasn't looking necessarily to get credit for it. Now, that's not to say there isn't strong testimony within the Pentateuch about the authorship being by Moses, but the concept of authorship that the Hebrews had is not the same as what we have, and that explains some of the problems and questions. Well, let me talk about this. First, let's look at the testimony to the Mosaic authorship and that it occurred between 1450 and 1400 BC. The C, the little C there, means circa, means about. This is about as close as we can get to be sure, to make sure. First, there is very strong testimony in the Pentateuch itself, in the first five books of the Bible, that Moses wrote it. Here are just a few of the passages which say Moses wrote this book. Moses was directed by God to put this in writing. Moses communicated this as God had directed him to the Hebrew people. Moses' name is specifically used as being responsible for the content of the writing here, having received it from God. Exodus 17, 14, 24, 4, 34, 27. Then in Numbers 33, 1 and 2, Deuteronomy 4, 44, 28, 58, 31, 9 to 13, 32, 44 to 47, and on and on. There are a lot of places where either Moses' name is specifically used or, or it's very clear that's who they're talking about. Which is why it talks about the law of Moses, because Moses was the one who received the law and who was the law giver to the Hebrew people as inspired by God. So within the Pentateuch itself, there are many, many circumstances, many, many occasions in which it attributes the writing of those five books to Moses. All right? Now, secondly, in other Old Testament books, Joshua 1, 7 to 8, 8, 31, 22, 5, 23, 6, in 1 Kings 2, 3, 10, 31, 2 Kings 14, 6, 21, 8, 23, 25, in Daniel 9, 11 to 13, plus many more references and many more direct quotes from the Pentateuch. Even if they don't mention Moses, they will say, and as God has communicated in the law, and they'll quote something directly from the, the Pentateuch. Now, there's a significance about this. When I say that it's very important that Moses wrote this and he wrote it when he said he did, some liberal scholars, more modern liberal scholars, have said that the Pentateuch wasn't actually written until the 5th century BC, almost a thousand years later. Well, that thousand year gap, that difference between what tradition says, when tradition says the book was written by Moses, and when other scholars say it was written, maybe by Ezra, for instance, which was one of the first, Baruch Spinoza said that Ezra wrote it in the 400s, 500s, during, well, around 500 during the exile, Babylonian exile. Well, the difference is all of these references to the law, these quotes from the Pentateuch, these references to what God has revealed, if the book wasn't actually written until way after all of those events occurred, how did those references get in there unless somebody's pulling one over on us? <clears throat> so if you say the book was not written for 900 years later, which liberal scholars tend to say, then all the rest of the Old Testament has to be drawn into question. Because there's so many references that quote directly from the Pentateuch as being the foundational documents on which they're based. You understand that? Does that make sense? It's not just a matter of, well, Moses, maybe Moses didn't write it. Everything begins to unravel. Because every other reference to the Pentateuch and to Moses and to the law, none of it makes none of it can be relied on if it really was written that much later. Because every one of those references, and there are dozens of them, suddenly can't be true if the liberal scholars are right. Okay. Then we also have testimony in the New Testament to Moses as being the author. Um, Matthew 22, 24, and 31 in Mark. I'm not going to give you the references. You can look at those later. Luke, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Revelation. Now, in some cases, it's actually Jesus or the apostles, you know, Paul or others, referring to the law of Moses or Moses having written. In some cases, it's that the Pharisees in, in the Gospels confronting Jesus will quote something and say, according to Moses, and Jesus never says, oh, no, 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 actually Moses didn't write that. Okay. He never, 
Jesus never comes back and challenges the idea that there's authority to this because Moses wrote it. Because that is the authoritative statement for a Jew. Was This is according to Moses, the lawgiver. The anointed one of God who gave us an understanding of who God is and what he's done. Um, there's never a challenge to any of that in the New Testament. And there are quite a few places where they do say, as Moses wrote, or according to the writings of Moses, or according to the law of Moses. And they quote the Pentateuch. Did Which, Moses have a scribe? Well, we'll talk about that. Okay. Whether, whether Moses had somebody assisting him. We'll get into that in a second. Um, which is a good question. And then finally, the unanimous witness throughout all of Jewish and Christian tradition. The number of Jewish scholars um, down through the, the 1400 years after Moses, the, Jew, the Christian scholars from Jesus' time through... Well, and there's still scholars today that that line hasn't broken, but it wasn't until the 18th century that anybody seriously started questioning it, Spinoza. Uh, and then in the 19th century with German liberal scholars, and I'm going to talk about that a second here. The tradition has always been, Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. The tradition is unbroken. In fact, Maimonides, Rambam, probably the greatest of all of the Jewish teachers, he established the 13 fundamental principles of what Judaism is. And Maimonides said one of those principles is the Jewish faith is based primarily upon the law as given to Moses in the Torah. So one of the basic principles of the whole Jewish faith, and that's considered the encapsulating of what the Jewish faith is all about, Maimonides, is that Moses is the author of the Pentateuch, of the Torah. Okay? So... Every witness until the 18th century, and especially the 19th century, everyone agreed this was written by Moses. Fundamentally written by Moses. I'm going to come back to that question of, of scribes and stuff in a second. Then in the, in the 18th and especially 19th century, uh, we have the development of the higher criticism. Higher criticism, for those of you who took the Old Testament theology class, Higher criticism is the study of what came before and is behind the scripture as we have today. Especially it's concerned with the dating, the authorship, the composition, and the unity of the writings. And higher criticism is focused more on the Pentateuch than all the rest of the Bible put together. The first five books, and I think that's an indication of their importance. So much attention has been paid to them. Because they are foundational to everything else. And yet more challenges have been put to the Pentateuch than anything else. And those challenges have pretty much without exception been supra-rationalistic. In other words, if, if we can't rationally conceive of it, of everything, then it can't, you know, it can't be real. In other words, it's anti-supernatural. There couldn't have been a miraculous crossing of the Red Sea, you know. The angel could, there could not have been an angel that stayed the hand of Abraham from, from sacrificing Isaac. You know, it's, none of these things, if they're in any way supernatural or something beyond our ability in reason to conceive of, they can't be. And in addition, higher criticism developed a very strict evolutionary kind of expectation that literature, along with everything else, evolves. And the idea that there is something that would be fundamentally true 3,400 years ago, nah. People were stupid back then. Okay, we're smarter than that now. Actually, in case you didn't know this, we're not. We're not. We've not gotten any better. We've not gotten any smarter. We may have more technology, but that doesn't mean we're any smarter. Okay. Um, I had that discussion with somebody recently who said, "Well, people have gotten better. People are better now than they were back then." No, we're not. Society has done a better job of controlling us. Society has gotten more sophisticated with police forces and you know all all of that. But, you know, you all have heard of Jack the Ripper, right? Why do you know of Jack the Ripper? He only killed a very few women in England 150 years ago or whatever. You know about him because he was the first time we really had a serial killer that had no motive other than to kill people. That's why Jack the Ripper is so famous. But we've had a bazillion of those since then. He kind of invented it as best we can tell the idea of a serial killer. So tell me the people are getting better. All right? We're not. Society is doing a better job of controlling us. People are not getting better. People are also not getting smarter. Okay? We're really not. Okay, 
Here's a little sermon for you. Uh, I want to talk now about higher criticism and then how it applies and why we disagree with what it says about particularly the Pentateuch. Um, documentary hypothesis. A man named Julius Wellhausen, or Wellhausen, since he was German, who wrote, his primary document was printed in 1899. I told you, 19, end of 19th century was when most of this happened. He was the last in a series, or the most important in a series, he actually wasn't the last, uh, to deal with the theory of the Pentateuch, which challenges the mosaic authorship and the dating. There's a very, again, in your book, there's a, there's a good um, analysis of this kind of thing, and they even have a large sidebar that identifies the major players. Two of the major players were a theologian named Graf, and then after him, Julius Wellhausen. In fact, the theory is sometimes called the graf wellhausen hypothesis. We know it better as a documentary hypothesis. It, it started in the 18th century. Again, Baruch Spinoza was one of the first philosophers to sort of question, and he thought that Ezra uh, in the 500s would have written the Pentateuch, not Moses. So the idea was, um, to sort of boil it down, that the Pentateuch was the product of at least four, and depending upon which of these scholars you look into, some of them suggested as many as ten or more, different sources, none of them Moses, and all of whom came much later than Moses. Remember, Moses is 1450 to 1400 BC. As you can see up here, the, the, uh, Julius Wellhausen, the, the reason why he's the primary person is he's the one that sort of codified all this or put it all in one sort of theory. He identified four primary sources and even identified uh, approximate dates for those sources as being responsible for the Pentateuch. The first of them, and, and one of the reasons that he said that this was true is the fact that God is referred to by different names is one of the major reasons why people started saying, I guess like there's more than one writer. There are places in which uh, God is referred to as Yahweh. There are places in which, which is the proper name of God as he, as he gave it to Moses. There are places where he's referred to, to as Elohim, which means, you know, the Lord. It's, it's still kind of a proper reference, but it's a generic <clears throat> word. And then there are the, um, the what they call the Deuteronomic sources, or, uh, which is the, the sort of filling in the historical kind of stories and things. And then the priestly source, which is all the law parts of it. So... J is the Yahwist source, according to Wilhausen and the other documentary hypothesis. The reason it's J is because in German it's Yahwist with the J. So J, it's believed, is the, one of the, the first source, which was about 950 BC in the kingdom of Judah. Now you'll notice this is about 450 to 500 years after Moses, and after King David, and after the books of First and Second Kings and First and Second Samuel. Okay, it is after most of the history that we were talking about in the Old Testament, which quotes the Pentateuch and attributes this to Moses. So, if that's the oldest of the sources for the Pentateuch, all those other writings that quote Moses and quote the Pentateuch, and you know, in the times of David and Solomon, etc., they must be wrong. They must it must be made up. Everything unravels. That's perceived by Wellhausen as being the oldest of the four sources that contribute to the Pentateuch. Then you have the E, the Elohim source, the ones that refer to God as Elohim, which he believed were 850 BC from the kingdom of Israel in the north. Then the Deuteronomist source, D, about 600 BC from Jerusalem. And then the priestly source, about 500 BC, which was from the Jewish priest exile in Babylon. There is no data to support this. None. Nada. It is entirely made up. It's People like Wellhausen and others would read this and go, that sort of sounds like what people might have said in, oh, I don't know, 950 B.C. in the southern kingdom of Judah. Hmm. Write that down. I'm not being facetious. There is no data. In fact, one of the particular... Uh, phenomena associated with this is when there has been uh, archaeological evidence or other historical evidence that counters this, they completely discount it and go, oh no, we're not talking about that stuff. We don't care about those sort of, you know, pottery shards and all that, you know. And they go, but this proves that that's not true. They go, oh, no, 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 we don't care about that. You're just, you're just messing around with our theory and our theory is really good. 
I, I, and I'm not, I, I'm not demeaning academic pursuits. I, I hope you can tell. I believe in academic pursuits. This is completely ungrounded. It's like that I've referred to the time I was watching the special of the Jesus Seminar guys, the very liberal Jesus Seminars, and one of them was sitting there and he goes, well, you know, the Gospels say this, but I prefer to think, and I'm thinking, you prefer to think, and I used a profanity saying, well, who cares what you prefer to think? Where do you get this? There's no data. There's no... And what happens is, if we believe this, as many liberal scholars, I mean, this is what's taught in a lot of schools still, even though it's being questioned more and more and more, uh, it used to sort of hold, hold sway in the, in the first part of the 1900s and, you know, through most of the 20th, much of the 20th century, the first third to half at least. And then other scholars start coming along going, wait a minute, that doesn't wash. You can't say that. You don't have support for that. Because if this is true, then there's virtually no historical veracity or believability or reliability to any of Scripture. Not just the Pentateuch, which is obvious, but to anything that comes after that that's based on it that refers to it. Um, uh, first, yeah. Uh, how did this make the inroads that it did? Well, there was a period of time... we have to memorize this stuff and it's not... You know, just to know that it's not right. It is true that when you look at it, there are places they refer to God as Yahweh, and places they you know, and so there's little bits and pieces of data that they can say, oh, well, that's curious. Why is that? And then these guys came along, and it was during a period of time, following the Enlightenment, when the idea that the human rationality, the human mind, is the ultimate source for everything, and if the human mind can come up with an explanation, even if there's no support for it, then that's cool. And it was a time in which German theologians, I'm not trying to pick on Germans, I'm sorry about Flinke isn't here because he'd be waving his finger at me right now because he did last time. We went through a period of time in which German theologians were, especially the Tübingen school, the liberal theologians from Germany were controlling global theology. Nobody else was doing theology seriously. And this became the vogue, in vogue in Germany. What was the year of that? More or less. Well, he wrote 1899. I mean, the Tübingen School would have been uh, from 1870s until 19, probably 20s or 30s. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, but I mean, the Tübingen School is still there, and but it's it's not nearly as radical as it was. Um, and more and more scholars are beginning to come back now and say, yeah, I don't think so so much. All right. Um, but the they held sway, and sometimes I think it's because nobody else was taking the stuff seriously. And they were taking it seriously, even though they were wrong. And so they're the ones that got published, and they're the ones people start quoting. Because they came up with an explanation, and everybody else was asleep at the wheel. Carolyn? Haven't I heard this sometimes referred to as, instead of source, as like an editor or redactor? Redactor. Is there's, isn't there a difference? I mean, if, if maybe somebody came back and, and rewrote parts of it, at different times, wouldn't that give it a little more credibility? Well, what, what they claim, and I'm going to talk about the idea of scribes or, or you know, Moses had help in a minute, but um, what they believe is, one of the reasons this gets a little ridiculous if you look at it, I've actually seen texts of the Old Testament that were color highlighted based upon whether they were considered to be from the sources J, E, D, or P, and you'll have one verse with four colors in it. <laughs> I mean, it breaks it up into little clauses. Oh, this clause is from J. This clause is from E. This is a D clause. And what they believe is that there were four different sources. And then redactors. A redactor, redactor is a fancy word for editor. Okay, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's the basic way to understand it. That redactors came along and took those separate sources and wove them together to try to create the document we have today. And so there really are two functions. There was the writing of it, the source, and then there were the redactors that put it together. Now, for instance, I'll give you a good example. Uh, Genesis 1 tells the story of the creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, right? You get to chapter 2 of Genesis, and it, it sort of says, and I can't quote it as exactly, but it says, and here's how how creation happened. And it focuses especially on the creation of humanity, on Adam and Eve. That's where we get the story 
You know, at first it says that God created humanity, you know, but then it gets to chapter 2, and it gets into the detail about Adam naming the animals and then recognizing, God recognizing there was not a, a mate or a helper that was appropriate for Adam. And so God puts Adam into a sleep and takes a rib from his side and makes Eve. And Adam wakes up from anesthesia and says, so here now is one who was bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh and named her Eve. And you've got all that story. Well, their assumption is, well, you've got the creation story, which includes a reference to man. And then you've got this second creation story. That's what they call it, the second creation story. Those are two different stories. Different people wrote that. I read that, and I've read this many, many times, and thought, okay, could they be right? And no, I read it and say, if I'm writing a story, and the most important part is sort of one element as I'm writing the story, and then I sort of zoom in, and I go, now let me, let me give you some more details about this most important part. Because humanity is the highest point of God's creation. Genesis 1 is the overview of creation. Genesis 2 is where God gave Moses the message, he zooms in to tell us about us, about the people who are going to be reading this. I'm sorry, the camels and the lemurs were not going to read this. So there wasn't a reason to focus in on the, the special creation that involved the camels and the lemurs, but people are going to want to know more details about people being made. And so Genesis 2 zooms in and gives us that detail. It's not a separate story. It's an emphasizing of the part of the story in Genesis 1 that was most important to us. Because the message is written down for us. God didn't write it down because God wanted to remember it. He wrote it down for us. John? You know, I'm listening to this. And, and one can, can see how this all played out. This attack on the veracity of the authenticity of this word. And how it gained footing. And then added to the social discourse that rose the Third Reich. Mm -hmm. and brought in anti-Semitism because if you could find an academic, intellectual support for your ideology, you'll grab it. Mm -hmm. and, and it just points to me just how important and, and the, 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 the connection between society, our, our, our sociological structure, and correct theology is, yes. how important it is because that's why I asked you the timing of that. Why did it happen? Because you're talking about right before mm -hmm. or during the rise of the Third Reich, right. in which these men sought for every reason to discredit the Jews and to bring uh, to vogue anti-Semitism. Semitism. Semitism. So yeah, that's... and it's true. And the, the, the liberal German theology, the liberal German theologians control the church in the first part of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. The church supported Hitler. Exactly. The exception to that was what was called the Confessing Church, which was Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Niebuhr and some of the others, you know, who, who were against Bart, uh, Bart, who were against what Hitler was doing and, and believing that the church had sacrificed their whole principle. Well, how could the church do that? Well, it's because these were the people who were directing the German church at that time. Okay, and so there was no veracity. There's, you know. I'm sure that the academics back then would say, well, no, you know, this is an academic pursuit. Don't take it so personally. I'm sorry, but I do take it personally because you have just unplugged everything that means anything in human life. You have just made it all meaningless by taking away any kind of foundation that we have for understanding the nature of God, the nature of creation, the nature of humanity, and what's wrong with us, what we can do. Nothing makes any sense if we believe you're right. Let me give you some of the prejudices and the responses that are behind documentary hypothesis. Um, one is they believe that Moses could not, and this is back in 1899, this is in Melhausen's day, Moses could not have written the Pentateuch because writing was developed much later, and therefore Moses could not write. Well, we have now absolute proof, and again, this is one of those examples, when they started finding this, they went, oh, no, 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 we don't care about those old pottery shards. <coughs> Archaeology doesn't matter to us. We have, we have multiple examples now of writing that is far earlier than 1400 BC or 1450 BC. We even have Semitic writing in Egypt that's as early as 1800 BC, meaning the period of time of the exile, the fact that there were Semitic peoples in Egypt 
prior to and during the time when we, when the Pentateuch tells us that the Hebrew people under Joseph and his descendants were in Egypt from 1800 BC, long before Moses in 1400 BC. So one of the fundamental principles, they said, well, Moses couldn't have written this because Moses couldn't have written. Yes, he could. Are, are these documents or are they pottery or what? Well, we have a... Uh, the Semitics? Yeah, I, have, I, I, I go back. In, in fact, in the front of your study Bible, it's got some pictures and examples of some of that stuff. So, um, you, you know, you can probably find it in there. Uh, but it's just, it's, it's there. This, this is so widely accepted now that people can't even argue about it anymore. But again, archaeology was not of interest to the liberal theologians. Then secondly, the idea of the Torah or any part of the Bible being inspired and or protected by God, because we not only believe that God inspired Scripture, we believe He protected it. As His revelation has to be rejected outright, outright because it suggests there's something miraculous going on. And the documentary hypothesis, the liberal theologies of higher criticism, do not give any credence to anything supernatural. All right? The problem is that if we reject all things supernatural out of hand, we in effect are rejecting the existence of God. Miracles can't happen. Jesus could not have been the incarnate Son of God. He could not have been raised from the dead. Again, they didn't cross the Red Sea. None of this is possible. God didn't give them manna in the desert. None of that. If you start with the assumption that miraculous things or supernatural things are not possible, which the liberal theologians of that time did. Can't be miraculous, have to have some other explanation for it, which is part of what drove them in this. And then, a third one is that the differences in the text of the Pentateuch, for instance, different names for God, parallel stories like Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, the fact that um, Abraham and then later Isaac both lied to the local king and told them that their wife was really their sister. Um, that, that has to demand, and differences in style all demand different authors. Can't have been the same author because you've got parallel stories going on, you've got different names for God, you've got differences in style. Um, the, the Abraham and Isaac story, for instance, both of them lying to the local authority in order to keep themselves from getting in trouble by saying, my wife is actually my sister. It seems to me that if you saw your father do that and he got away with it, everything worked out fine, and you found yourself in a similar situation, maybe you learned to lie about it. Okay. We do learn things from our parents, after all. Um, so there are often explanations. But subsequent scholarship in the, in the Semitic writing styles has shown that these kind of variables are quite normal. People do use different names for God in different places, for instance. They have different styles. Be, okay, I'll give you a good example. Do you know what a telephone voice is? <laughs> do you? You know what it means to have a telephone voice? Hello, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, it's... You'll talk, like if I'm, if I'm talking to Carolyn or front of oh man, give me a break, what's going on? I answer the phone, hello, this is Ross. <laughs> I have a different tone, a different vocabulary. The fact is, people don't always communicate in exactly the same vocabulary or exactly the same tone, exactly the same way. That's a real obvious version, but research has shown that that's true <coughs> even in writing styles. Shakespeare's plays have been compared plays that we are quite convinced were written by the same person, and yet because of a different theme in those plays, the tone is very different. Even the vocabulary can be different. So studies have shown that differences in styles, those kind of variations can be quite normal, and a belief in Moses as being the primary writer of the Pentateuch does not mean that no other sources were used by Moses. We'll get to this in a second. Nor does it mean that minor additions could not have been added later by Joshua or others, such as the, Mo the reference to Moses' death. In the Deuteronomy, we have the story of Moses' death and burial. And people go, you think Moses wrote that? Well, it's possible Moses had a vision of his own death and he wrote it down. That is possible, because we believe that supernatural things can happen. Or it's possible that Joshua came along, Joshua, who was also anointed of God, who was also inspired to write divinely, that Joshua added that at the end in order to complete the story of the beloved Moses. Now, having said that, let me give you a couple of conclusions regarding Mosaic authorship. The critical arguments against Mosaic authorship are by far insufficient to set aside the manifold testimony of both Old and New Testaments, the continuous consensus of both Jewish and Christian people, including scholars, for over 3,000 years, 
and the internal consistencies of the text itself. Which means, we take all of that out and say it didn't really happen, for, wasn't really written 1400 uh, BC. There's no consistency in anything else. Okay. Are we prepared to pay that price? I don't, it does, there's not sufficient evidence to throw it away. And then the second point I would make is that the Mosaic authenticity of the Pentateuch does not mean that Moses could not have drawn on previous sources, as in the stories of Genesis. You know, the story of Noah, the story of Babel, uh, even the story of, his, of Abraham and the other, you know, the relatives of Abraham. Moses could have been inspired by God to use written and oral sources that came before him and have included them in the inspired writing of the Pentateuch. There's nothing that violates that you know, any more than <clears throat> Paul quotes pagan philosophers in places just to prove a, a, a reasonable point. And yet they became inspired writing when he took them and used them in his own, in, in, this, in what God inspired him to write. The same thing is true of Moses. There's nothing that says that Moses could not have used earlier sources and used them in the inspired writing. Nor does it mean that he must, he might not have entrusted some of the writing to others under his direction. We've talked about that in terms of the uh, amanuensis is the Greek word for it, the secretary. Frequently, apparently, the writers even in the New Testament would say, Here's the message that, that we need to communicate. And outline it all verbally. The secretary, the amanuensis, would write it down and then read it back. And they go, no, 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 that's not the right word. Change this. And they would edit it and then say, yep, that is that is what I believe God is, is having you to communicate to that church in Philippi or, or send it off. We do know that there were amanuensis used in the New Testament. There even, it's even named in one place. So there's nothing that says that Moses could have done the same thing or that there might have not have been minor additions like the story of Moses' death and burial by other inspired writers such as Joshua or maybe even Ezra um, to, to add that later. That does not challenge or question the fundamental authorship by Moses. All right? Neither of those things, him drawing on, or neither of those three things, him drawing on earlier sources and including them, him having other people assist him with the writing, or there being minor kinds of additions, like the death of Moses story by Joshua, coming later, that still doesn't fundamentally alter the fact that it is um, Mosaic authorship. You got that? That makes sense? Questions about that? And I believe that gives us a sense of understanding how we have the document we have, without throwing it all away. And when I say all, I mean everything. Away. Questions about any of that? Scribes? Well, the scribe uh, would be the amanuensis. In other words, somebody who's writing it down for him, the secretary. I think that's what you meant by scribe. Yeah. Scribe later on became the, the, the Hebrew word for scribe literally means a counter. Somebody who counts. Because the scribes were responsible for accuracy later, but technically they used the word scribe. And so they would count how many letters were in each row, how many, you know, a, a Hebrew scribe could tell you what was the center letter in the whole of the Old Testament, the whole Hebrew Bible, which letter was in the middle, okay? Um, or in the Pentateuch, or which word was the center word. They counted everything, and they did that in order to try to be, make sure that they copied it right. And since we couldn't photocopy things back then or print them off. But I think what the question Rich was asking was, might he have had a secretary, somebody who worked with him and wrote it down for him? It's possible, very possible. In fact, maybe even likely. Okay. Paul did. John did, Peter did, we believe John Mark was the secretary and writer for, for Peter. Um, that's where we get the Gospel of Mark. So yes, it's very possible, even likely, that, that Moses would have. Any questions about any of that? You need to understand, I mean, uh, some, some schools take the approach, they're not even going to get into this because they think it's so wrong and we don't want to confuse you. I think you need to know about this, so if you ever bump into anybody, go, oh no, Moses didn't write, da da da. You need to know that modern scholarship, and more and more and more modern scholarship is beginning to say, you know, apparently he did. And your book, the, the book you have, does a pretty good job of beginning to approach some of that modern scholarship stuff. Yes? So today, if, if you're reading like a, a, a contemporary writer, and he refers to like Genesis 1 or Genesis 2, then he is a documentary hypothesis. Well, it depends on how he refers to it. I mean, he could be referring to it as a personal belief. What do you mean? Well, Bruggen, for instance, okay. will refer to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. 
as two separate things. As two separate things. Well, just so, if, you, if they have a separate source, then they would in some way be a believer in the documentary hypothesis, and I don't think that's necessary. And a lot of scholars don't. Don't, don't think that I'm out on a limb here telling you something that's just my idea. Most evangelical scholars today would disagree in exactly, part in but what, the point I'm making is if he, if he refers to Genesis 1 or Genesis 2, and I think in Isaiah 1, he, he Isaiah re 2, refers to the two Isaiahs, yeah. Yeah, then he's, he's probably referring to this documentary hypothesis. Right? Absolutely. And again, people aren't all one or the other. I mean, people are not that consistent. You know, they may hold to parts of it and not other parts of it. There may be part they absolutely insist on, some they say, I don't know. So, yeah, you can't brand everybody as being one or the other. Um, but fundamentally, I believe if we accept the theories behind the, the documentary hypothesis, everything else has gone out the window. And so, go home, have a beer, take it easy. Because this apparently is a waste of time if they're right. I don't think they are, or I wouldn't be doing this. Okay, I want to spend the next few minutes giving you a really, really quick overview, and I've done it a little bit already, of the first five books, and then next week we're going to jump into detail about Genesis 1 to 11, the prehistoric prologue. Okay? Um, the book of Genesis. You'll notice I believe the author is Moses. <laughs> oh, really? um, I think we've made that point. Date 450 to 1450 to 1400 BC, so we're looking at. Um, this is about 400 to 500 years after Abraham, 1400 years or so before Jesus. The theme of the book of Genesis is beginnings, origins. That's what the name means. Uh, the origin of the universe, of the human race, and of the Jewish people. We'll break that down a little bit next week. 1 to 11 is the creation of the universe, the creation of humanity included in that, then the fall, the flood, Tower of Babel, and then at the end of chapter 11, we get into the creation of the Jewish people through Abram and Sarai, who became Abraham and Sarah. The purpose is to show that the Creator God is sovereign and that He loves His creation. Notice that loves the creation part. He does not have to struggle. He does not, there's no explanation for where God came from. He is, he is a given, and so therefore He is sovereign over all that He is. But He is not a sovereign God who is distant or malicious, like the Greeks, the Greek gods, enjoyed nothing better than to torment human beings just to see which way they jumped. That's not our God. That's not the God of the, of the Pentateuch. He is a loving God. And he demonstrates that over and over again. The two big sections of the book of Genesis, the prehistoric prologue, chapters 1 to 11, actually, you know, mid part of 11, which is creation, fall, flood, and Babel, and then the story of the Hebrew people, the beginning of the Hebrew people, from chapter 11 to 50. First, Father Abraham, then Abraham's son Isaac, Isaac's son Jacob, and then one of Jacob's son Joseph. Now, like, as I said before, Joseph is not a patriarch. In fact, the line of, uh, from Abraham to Jesus does not go through Joseph. It goes through Judah. And yet, Joseph was such an important uh, historical character in, in the Hebrew people and why they were in Egypt and everything else that much, uh, as, as you'll notice, Chapter 37 through 50 is really the story of Joseph. How he ended up sold by his brothers in Egypt, you know, became famous, welcomed his family back, took care of them. You know, that's the Joseph story. Now, let me give you uh, two. This map, Jerry's not here, but I found my pointer anyway. This, uh, the book has a similar version to this map in which they talk about the fact there are three major sort of geographical areas that the Pentateuch is concerned with. The first one is, you'll see here, Mesopotamia. The Tigris River is here. The Euphrates River is here. Mesopotamia literally means the land between the rivers. And because these rivers were here, this area, you see the green, all right? And the green actually, if, if, if we had it, would go down here, all right? Down, this is the Nile River. This is called the Fertile Crescent. You ever heard that expression, the Fertile Crescent? The reason it's the Fertile Crescent is you get south and you've got the Arabian Desert. You get over here and you've got, you know, you've got desert lands. Uh, but this area here was fertile because of the rivers. So Mesopotamia, this area where Babylonia and Assyria, the Sumer, you'll notice Garden of Eden right here. This is Ur, 
Uh, Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees. Abraham came from down here in Mesopotamia, but ended up going up and living, you know, uh, in this area, which is the second area, from here, that is from the curve here of the Euphrates River, down to here, this is called Syria, Palestine. Syria up here, Palestine down here, that's the second geographical area. Or Canaan, as it's also called in the Old Testament. And then the third geographical area is Egypt down here, which you don't see as much. Let me give you a different version here. Gives you, pulls back a little bit, and the red are the modern countries. You'll notice mm -hmm. Lebanon is here, Israel is here, Jordan, Syria, Iraq is here, Iran is this big chunk here, Turkey, where the Hittites used to be, is up here, and then Egypt has a change. Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, Sudan, Eritrea, and Ethiopia, what used to be the land of Kush. So, the three big geographical areas were Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, Syria, uh, Palestine here, and Egypt. Those are the lands that are affected by the Pentateuch. And in fact, are, are involved in just the book of Genesis, until they get back into the Holy Land, in, uh, starting, starting in Joshua. Okay, questions about that? Now, again, the second book, the book of Exodus. The author was, ding, 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 Moses, circa 1446 to 1440, that's like a year later, or a couple years later than the other one was. Um, it's believed that Moses may have actually written all of this stuff down during the 40 years in the wilderness. Because what else you going to do? Um, that that was the opportunity for him to capture, you know, all that God had done and said to him. There are other places, parts of it, like the Canticle of Moses and other parts, where we have specific instruction in the Pentateuch that God said, write this down right now and share with them. So not all of it was written, but the bulk of some of the stuff may have been written when they were wandering in the wilderness. The story or theme is God's deliverance of his chosen people, the key word being redemption, uh, the purpose to show God's faithfulness in his, to his covenant and giving directions for living. And the two parts are, one, God's redemption by bringing the people up out of slavery in Egypt. For the whole rest of the history of the Jewish people, up until right now, like the, the um, Shabbat dinner, they will rehearse or re retell you know, that God brought us up out of slavery in Egypt. Right? Uh, and throughout the whole Old Testament and until modern times, They'll say, our God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who brought us up out of slavery in Egypt. All right. And so that redemption in terms of the exodus from Egypt is a, is a fundamental plank in the Jewish understanding of their history and who they are. And then the second part is God's covenant, the giving of the law, the fulfillment or the, the sort of a, um, assurance of his pleasure in choosing them as the chosen people was that he gave them a constitution. The law of Israel, the Mosaic law that was given at Sinai, is very much like the Constitution for the Jewish people. This is, this is how you're supposed to live. It included, really, their law, just like our Constitution does. Um, and, and then a lot of other detail in terms of instruction for life. And we're going to talk next week, uh, I'm sorry, in four weeks, we'll talk about the covenant in terms of law, and then tabernacle and worship. It gets into a lot of kind of details, uh, even in Exodus. Then we get to the next book, which is Leviticus, the one that some people just skip over when they get to reading through the Old Testament, and they shouldn't. Um, similar timeline, same author, the explanations of law and sacrifice, the key word is holiness. How do you be holy? How do you appropriate God's grace if you were a Jewish people you know, 3,400 years ago? It is instruction to Israel on how to be holy and how to be a blessing to others. It's not just about you, Israel, God was saying. This is how you treat others, including the widow and the orphan and the foreigner who is in your land. You know, there's a lot of that. So it deals with themes of sacrifice, of priesthood, of what is clean and unclean, of the Day of Atonement as a special day of the year for the forgiveness of sin, and then laws for daily life. How are you supposed to live in a way that is honoring to me, God said. As I said before, Exodus is the book about what God did for his people. Leviticus is what God expects his, their people, the people to do in response, in gratitude even, for what God has done for them. All right? We then have the book of Numbers. Again, a in, uh, in the Greek, 
it has, it's called that because it is a book about census. It is the wandering of the Jewish people for 40 years. And in that time, again, not a lot to do, so they kept counting each other. At least twice. Um, the purpose is to show what can happen when God's people rebel against him. And after their great show of unfaith and not believing that God, God was strong enough to let them take, take the promised land because there are giants in those lands, then every male adult, except for two who believed God, Joshua being the main one, all of them had to die so that the whole generation of unfaith was gone and a whole new generation had been brought up before the Israelites would be allowed out of the desert and into the promised land because of their unfaith. After all, God had done for them and shown to them and proven to them by parting the Red Sea and everything else, they still didn't believe it. So chapters 1 to 9 has to do with the census, then Sinai to Canaan. The spies are sent out, and then the rebellion against the report of the spies, and then the time they spend at Moab. And then the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the retelling of the law, which is what Deuteronomy means, the second law. Again, by Moses, you'll notice it's quite a bit later. This happens right before the people are ready to cross over from Moab across the Jordan River. Moses, because of an act of unbelief he had had, he didn't do what God told him at one point. God said, you're not going to get to see it. You're not going to get to go into the land. You are going to get to see it. And he takes him up on the mountain and says, look out um, and see the land I had promised. Moses gets to see it, but then he dies and is buried. The key word there is covenant because it is a restating of the covenant of the law. Um, to remind the people what God expects for them. And it's made up of three sermons by Moses. And then the final farewell. Sermon 1 is a review of the journey the Israelites have gone through. Uh, sermon 2 is where the law gets reviewed. Because again, it's been 40 years since the law was given. And this is a retelling of the law so the new generation has heard it. And then a restatement of the covenant before the final farewell. And that's the last of the five books of the Pentateuch. Today's been an overview. Background. Next week we get into Genesis 1-11. to Any questions about that? Now, did you all pick up one of these in the back, which is the reading list? If not, I mean, it's online. You can, you can download it from online. But if you can't print it out or you want to have a paper copy and you can use one more piece of paper at home, you can pick up one of these. Just kidding. Now, I'm going to say this each of the three weeks. This class is unaffected. This class will meet on Wednesday for the next eight weeks. If you pick one of these up, you'll notice that the Thursday class, which is Life and Teachings of Jesus, twice we're not going to meet on Thursday, we're going to meet on Monday. And I've highlighted that in yellow and I've written it in. The reason is because I have to be in, um, well, I've got two trips I have to make. And so that's the two, the two times that the Life and Teachings of Jesus will meet on Monday instead of Thursday. Likewise, those same weeks, the Church History 1, the Apostles of Pre-Reformation, will meet on Tuesday on those weeks. So pay attention to the dates. I've highlighted it on here. Um, I'm sorry if that's an inconvenience for anybody. You, you will be able to go because it, you know, the change is that we're meeting early. If you can't meet early and you, you can take the time on Thursday or on Friday when you would ordinarily meet and watch the videos and catch up with it that way. I hope you'll come to class because I think it's, there's value in doing that, but those are two weeks I have to be gone at the end of the week. And I've tried to do it, schedule it in advance so that uh, we don't have to jockey it around in the course like we did last, last round. Any questions or comments? Are we getting there? You see what we're doing? Everybody good? Didn't see anybody fall asleep. Well, a little. Okay. <laughs> Some people want Christian to take the class. Okay, that's it. God bless you all, and uh, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow.